So it is Independence Day weekend. Happy birthday. What are we, 277 or 244? 244. That's, that's a good run. You know, it's wonderful to celebrate the heritage we have as a nation because we do. This, this experience, this experiment in freedom and liberty has produced amazing things. And we cannot take that for granted. We cannot thank God enough for our blessings here as a nation. But we also need to take warning. Many of us think that freedom, uh, the way we practice freedom these days, is an un unlimited license to do whatever you want. I warn you. That's not a biblical definition of freedom. The Bible would define freedom as liberty from sin to fully pursue God. That's biblical liberty. And that involves actually a fair amount of what we're going to talk about this morning, interdependence. So we're going to talk about Interdependence Day. And as we're, one of the reasons we're doing this is we're addressing some of the hot questions that came out of our experience in COVID and social isolation and all things that went on. It raised these interesting theological issues that we don't really think about from day to day, but are actually foundational. And we're gonna talk about one this morning. We're gonna talk about our need for relationship. God made us to need and B, he designed us to work within interdependent relationships. And we're going to go back to the very beginning. We're going to go back to creation. But before we do, I'm going to tell you a story. When I was a wee lad of three and a half years old, my parents went on a vacation to Cadillac Mountain, Maine, in a camper. And a family of six kids, so eight in all, were experiencing a wonderful day on Cadillac Mountain, and I was grazing among the blueberries, three and a half years old. The family decided, well, it's time to go. And one half of my family that was in the cab of the truck thought I was in the camper. The people who were in the camper thought I was in the cab. Away went the family, down Cadillac Mountain. My mother finally had an inkling that I was not with them. And they confirmed that no, three and a half year old Mark was not with them. I was all alone on top of Cadillac Mountain. So they turned the camper around and my father hit the gas in a camper. Yeah, you know how that works. <laughs> okay. Went as fast as they could up the mountain to find their desperately alone child. And there I was, skipping from rock to rock, grazing on blueberries, oblivious to the fact that, they, that I was alone. Didn't even, it didn't even occur to me that they weren't there. I was having way too much fun. So I tell that story because not all aloneness is bad. I'll tell another story. Toward the end of college, I had a group of friends that we were passionate in our pursuit of Christ together. We were part of a Bible study. We got close. We were, we were friends. They were more than friends. We were a band of brothers. A lot of them were further along the college than I was. They all graduated and went off to their adult life. I was still back in college. It was a big university, 13,000 people. And I was still living at home with my family. I was still part of a church, but I felt lonely. I was surrounded by people in my life, but I felt lonely. Now think of that. Think of that contrast. I was completely alone on the top of Cadillac Mountain. <clears throat> Wasn't a problem. Later on in life, I was completely surrounded by people. I felt lonely. 
Aloneness and loneliness. We're going to talk about that this morning. First, we're going to talk about aloneness. When we look at the the account of God's creation of Adam and Eve, it gets very, very interesting. Why does God create Adam and Eve this way? He forms Adam out of the dirt, and at this point, in chapter 2, verse 15, it's just Adam. The Lord, it says in verse 15, the Lord God took the man, Adam, and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. The Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of all the trees in the garden, but the the tree of the knowledge of evil you shall not eat. Adam is alone. In fact, God later on will note that he is alone. In one sense, it's not bad that he is alone because at the minimum, he has God. God is with him. God just formed him. God just breathed into him. God also gave him a place, Eden. He gave him work, tending the garden. He also gave them him instruction. He gave him a command. So God gives him his own presence. He gives him a place to be. He gives him work to do. And he gives him instruction or his word. That's all when Adam is alone. So one thing when we talk about social isolation Not all aloneness is bad. For many people, being alone is a terrifying experience. Especially you extroverts out there. I I see you, Kelly. Being alone for more than five minutes, you begin to, you know, you sweat. You know, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I have no one to talk to. Us introverts enjoy it a little more. In fact, when I go for a walk, I don't bring any headphones. I just, me, and I I go on a nice long walk, and I walk with God. I think, I pray, I meditate. I am alone, but I'm not completely alone. I am in the presence of God. He's given me his presence. He's given me a place. He's given me work to do. He's given me his word. That's a lot. That's a lot in my aloneness with God. Aloneness can unmask an inadequacy in our relationship with God. How many people during social isolation suddenly realized, you know, God and I don't talk much. Sometimes being alone can open our eyes to how much we've neglected in our relationship with God. Aloneness can also grow our relationship with God. How many people actually read more of Scripture, invested more in their relationship with God during social isolation? A lot of us. You see, not all aloneness is bad. However, God tells us that in this case, it is bad. Verse 18 says this, Then the Lord God said, It is not Good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. God, when he created in chapter one, he created something and said, this is good. Created something, this is good. Created something else, this is good. Created man in chapter one, it says, this is very good. Chapter two, when he goes into a a microscope of the creation of man, he first creates Adam but he hasn't created Eve yet, and he says, this is not good. So this aloneness is bad because it's aloneness. He, Adam is, has no one of his kind. He has no one that he can connect with. Friend to friend, husband to wife, partner. A partner suitable for him. He does not have this, and this is not good, God says. So let's just pause on this. God is creating in this kind of interesting way, Adam first, then Eve, to teach us dense-headed men, (laughs) we don't need, we shouldn't be alone. I say that jokingly. He's teaching all of us. 
He has built us all, designed us all to be in relationship with each other. And this just is not husband and wife. This is true throughout scripture. The importance of fellowship and friendship is a foundational principle from one end of scripture to the next. Not all aloneness is bad, but this aloneness, not having any compatriots, is not good. We are designed for community. What this does is it brings the, mo- the opportunity for loneliness to set in. If in our aloneness we have no one like us, no one that draws near to us or that we can draw near to in friendship, it then creates loneliness, the experience, the negative experience of being alone. And a lot of us experience loneliness. A lot of us are probably experiencing loneliness right now. Maybe we've lost someone in our life. And the loneliness is deep. Maybe it's, we're just at an interesting place in our life where we just don't have close friends by or families not nearby and we're just, we're feeling it. Loneliness. Maybe we've always struggled to have close friends. And we never thought of it before, but yeah, I've always been lonely. We experience loneliness. I think God teaches Adam something because he wants him to experience loneliness in the following verses. Verse 19 says, God formed out of the ground every beast of the field and brought it before him to be named. So Adam kind of saw the elephants go by, this male and female. He saw the the eagles fly by, oh, male eagle and a female eagle. He saw, you know, all these creatures go by and it says there was not a helper fit for him that was found. Out of all the animals, even dogs, The dogs are man's best friend. No, even dogs do not fit the bill. There was no creature suitable for Adam. And I believe this is to teach teach Adam and to teach us that we are uniquely designed for community with our own kind as creatures. I know you love your dogs. I get it. Well, I don't get it, but I know I, but... A dog can never be what a human can be. Loneliness. The causes of loneliness, they're vast. Sometimes it's insecurity. I don't feel good enough to be a friend to anyone. Good enough to have a relationship. Sometimes you've been hurt. Relationships are risky and painful. I don't want to be in them. Sometimes they're circumstances of life, unavoidable, uncontrollable, that cause us to feel alone. There's a lot of reasons we feel loneliness. Loneliness also carries risks. I'm going to read from the CDC website on the health risks of loneliness. Because, you know, the CDC, they're they're credible, right? But this is what the CDC tells us about loneliness. Social isolation significantly increased a person's risk of premature death from all causes. A risk that may rival those of smoking, obesity, and physical inactivity. Okay. Social isolation was associated with about a 50% increase in the risk of dementia. Poor relationships characterized by social isolation um, was associated with a 29% increase in the risk of heart disease and a 32% increase in the risk of stroke. 
Loneliness was associated with higher risks of depression, anxiety, and suicide. Loneliness among heart failure, uh, failure patients was associated with a nearly four times increased risk of death. So in other words, with heart patients, if they're lonely, the likelihood is higher that they're going to, four times higher that they're going to die. A 68% increased risk of hospitalization and a 57 increased risk of emergency department visits. So according to the CDC, loneliness is a tremendous health risk. Physically, lonely people die sooner, more quickly, and suffer more illness than non-lonely people. Okay, so God made us, designed us to be in relationship for our physical health, for one, but I would also argue for our spiritual health. He designed us to be spiritually healthy in relationship. I'm going to read from Ecclesiastes 4, and you're going to think, oh, this is just about work. It's not. It's about the spiritual, the spiritual relationship we have with each other. Ecclesiastes 4 tells us two are better than one because they have a good return on their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lay down together, they will, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one, may have, though, though, though one may be one overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. This piece of wisdom literature is drawing out the principle that relationship is critical to all aspects of life, including our spiritual life. Think through the unhealthy responses that people often engage in when they feel lonely, when they feel the emptiness of not having relationship. One of the things they'll turn to is idolatry. They'll throw themselves into something other than God that makes them feel significant beyond their emptiness. Maybe it's work. Maybe they'll set work up, they'll just become a workaholic. Work, 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 work. To cover up the emptiness. Maybe it's they'll begin indulging in sinful passions and pleasures. They'll just go from one experience to the next, trying to fill the emptiness. Maybe it's addictions. They, with the emptiness, the loneliness there, they fill themselves or they, they medicate themselves. And then they become addicted to that medication. Maybe it's mindless amusement. They can just distract themselves from their emptiness with entertainment then I, I won't feel as empty. You can see uh, all these spiritual pitfalls that are open to us when we feel lonely. When we don't feel lonely, when we feel connected with God, and when we feel connected with each other, these things, the temptations of these things, is not nearly as strong. So loneliness, loneliness hurts. It hurts us. It hurts us spiritually, emotionally, and physically. What does God design for us? Well, for Adam, he causes him to go to a deep sleep. He takes a rib. He fashions a helper suitable for him, a partner comparable to him. And he brings him to Adam. And lest you write this off and think, oh, that's just, that's just about weddings, marriage. It is specifically about marriage here, but the principle runs beyond marriage. There are many people in Scripture who are not married, 
but they still have a, a need, a creational need to be connected in friendship with one another. What I think God has created us for is actually not just friendship. He's created us for camaraderie. I use that word because fellowship doesn't feel strong enough for me. Fellowship used to be the word we use to describe it. It's the word scripture uses. But fellowship, I don't know, it feels trite these days. Fellowship is the thing we do after service when we drink coffee. Yeah, let's go fellowship. And we drink coffee for five minutes, then we go. We have a very small definition of fellowship. Some of us do. We tend to. But that's not a biblical understanding of fellowship. That's why I use the word camaraderie. I would define that as a purposeful friendship. It's not just five minutes of coffee after church. It's having a shared mission and a mutually life-giving friendship. It's not just friendship. It's friendship wrapped around a common mission. Many of us witness this or have experienced this serving in the military. That nothing has approached the kind of friendships that they had, especially those relationships forged in combat. Some of us experience this by being on athletic teams. Having a, a goal that one group of people just wraps their pursuit around, and in it, they go through the hard work of helping each other to achieve that goal. Others of, of us have found this in our families. Families that embrace a mission together experience a kind of fellowship as a family greater than I think other families do. There are many contexts in which we can experience this kind of purposeful friendship. And I believe that's what God hopes for us as a church. That we just don't come, take in church once a week. Maybe if we got time to go to a Bible study. But actually a church becomes a band of brothers. It becomes a group of, of purposeful friends, life-giving mutual relationships wrapped around a common purpose. There's a couple of pictures of this from the life of Paul. In the book of Philippians, he references two of his friends. Paul's not married, lived his whole life single, but he found purposeful friendship in the lives of many people that partnered with him in his ministry. One is Timothy. Paul is writing to the Philippian church about Timothy. And he says of Timothy, I have no one else like him. He says this, uh, that Timothy shows a genuine concern for the welfare of the Philippian church, which is what Paul shares with him. They love this church. He says of Timothy, he looks out for the interests of Christ. And then finally, he, he references how Timothy has served him. Paul says, he has served me like a son in the work of the gospel. So he says, has this powerful friendship, purposeful friendship with Timothy. Right after that, he introduces another one, Epaphroditus. He says, my brother, my co-worker, and fellow soldier. Now, he wasn't, Epaphroditus was not a soldier, but he uses the metaphor. He was my fellow soldier in the cause of Christ. He describes him being deeply empathetic towards the Philippian church. He says he almost died for the work of Christ and to help Paul. So Paul has this deep and powerful friendship wrapped around a common mission. And I believe this, when God said it is not good for man or humans to be alone, I think he has this in mind. I can go to a 
hundred places in Scripture. I can go to Paul and Jonathan in the Old Testament. I can go to Christ in the upper room when I says, I know, I now call you friends, he says. I can go to a hundred places in Scripture where it describes our need and the importance of this purposeful friendship. So my question this morning is, do you experience this? Is there a place of loneliness in your life that you need to fill with what God wants you to be filling it with? What does it mean to pursue purposeful friendship? Well, for one, it means taking initiative. How many of, how many of us married couples just bumped into your spouse in the grocery store and boom, you're married? It doesn't work that way. Marriages just don't spontaneously generate out of thin air. Someone, usually both, had to choose to take initiative in the relationship. Someone had to say, hey, you want to go out with me sometime? And the other one had to say, yeah, sure. And they nervously proceeded to their first date. And maybe it went well, maybe it was a little awkward. But then they had to take more initiative, right? This is how marriages happen, at least nowadays. We don't arrange them. Similarly with friendships, they just don't, we we tend to think, ah, a friendship, it should be organic and just happen naturally. I think true purposeful friendship requires us taking initiative. So let's go for coffee. Let's go for a hike. Come over and let's work on my car. Like, whatever. Begin taking initiative to find a purposeful friend. The other thing you can do is become engaged in mission. Find out where to serve because you will most definitely be knit to the heart of the person you're serving next to. If you're engaged in mission, you're going to suddenly realize, well, this person loves what I love. And you're going to begin loving doing it together. This is what God has for us in relationship, in community. Not just coffee for five minutes after church once a week, but purposeful friendship. God has designed us for that. And in that, he saves us from loneliness. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I'm thankful that when we are alone, we have you. But I'm also thankful that you have designed us for friendship and relationship one to another. That you've made us social creatures And I'm thankful that you have made a way out of loneliness. That in its most uh, amazing form, the church saves us from a life of loneliness. Teach us what it means to draw near to one another. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.